Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. I'm George Binns, and uh, we're doing a follow-up to uh, the show we did a couple of weeks ago with the Reverend Mio Zen, Joan Amaral, and she decided we should have another guest and welcome Lauren Barthold. So I guess the question we want to start talking about is, uh, what's going on in Beverly that uh, is related to all these situations across the country, the combination of Black Lives Matter, um, the downside of the, a lot of interaction with people that some of it's good, there's a lot of nasty stuff going on, and how do we get over this? So. Joan, you had some thoughts you wanted to start with. Hi, hi George, hi Lauren. It's good to be here again. I am committed to this relationship and this ongoing conversation. So um, yeah, I think it's important. There is a lot going on and I think it is really important to stay in conversation, especially when we have different views. We have different experiences of what's going on. For some of us, it may be exciting what's going on. And for some of us, it may be terrifying what's going on. And maybe for many of us, it's both exciting and terrifying. But it does feel like tectonic shifting is happening right now. And um, I'm very glad, Lauren, that you're here because I, because of your work around communication, encouraging communication and, and encouraging conversation, maybe, um, and this is kind of an improv here, but maybe Lauren, would you say some, a few words about the work that you've been doing in Beverly around maybe race amity and community conversations, anything else you feel like sharing? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Jim. And, uh, great to be here, George. Um, yeah, so I'm Lauren, I live in Beverly, and um, I um, teach philosophy and peace studies, and I'm also program director for the Heathmere Center for Cultural Engagement. And one of my um, philosophical and practical interests is dialogue. And actually, um, my, I don't know if I told you this, Joan, but um, my uh, book on dialogue, well, actually, I didn't tell you it because I just found out today. It was actually published online uh, yesterday, and it will be coming out, I'm not sure from far back when, but it's called Overcoming Polarization in the Public Square in Civic Dialogue. And so this is something that I've written about theoretically, but I'm very concerned about and interested in locally. And you mentioned the community conversations here in Beverly a number of years ago um, not sure how many years, maybe two or three years ago, a group of us were um, coming together to create community conversations uh, because we really wanted to find out a way to help Beverly residents of various um, perspectives come together and talk. And uh, due to a variety of reasons, um, it's not been so active recently, but more recently I have been involved um, with the Heathmere Center that works with youth and young adults uh, through dialogue and arts programming. And our most recent event was Race Amity Day, which was the third year it was uh, celebrated in, well, Beverly. It was on Zoom this year. And um, we actually had Mayor Driscoll from Salem, so I don't want to be too Beverly-centric here, but... Um, Race Amity Day is um, a official holiday uh, written a proclamation. Governor Baker wrote it as a proclamation in 2015, and so we've been celebrating it. But um, really the goal of that for um, each year is to think about what it means to have friendship across difference. How do we cultivate that? And so that's something that I'm interested in personally, theoretically, but practically, just in terms of, of community. And so that's why I'm really glad to be here today, because I've appreciated, I've watched some of your other shows and appreciated your questioning and both of you seeking to understand, mutual understanding is what I call the aim of dialogue. And so 
um, just happy to be here thinking this through and um, yeah, how do we get people together during this time of um, such racial trauma, tension, uh, tragedy in, in the United States, but of course here in Beverly. Um, we've had some protests, we've had some marches, I know people are meeting. Um, there's a lot of webinars online, there's petitions. Um, but how do, we, how do we get really people of different stripes so it's not the sort of Facebook echo chamber? Um, how do we get them coming together? And I think one, one way I always like to start off dialogues is really by asking about people's personal experience or trying to understand their background. The dialogue is really trying to stay away from arguments and persuasion. So um, when I enter into a dialogue, I um, try not to, but talk to my husband, he'll disagree, persuade people that they're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> um, so yeah, what does, that, what does that look like for us? So I don't know, um, I've been talking a lot. I don't know if, if, if it would be okay if I share a little experience of my own perspective. Yes, that would this. be that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in uh, Pennsylvania a long time ago. A uh, very white um, culture, land, community. Um, and I tried to be a good person. You know, uh, we had our token, I would say, black student in just about every school I attended. Um, and my parents were definitely um, pretty explicitly racist in each directed to a different racial group. Um, and I always thought that was wrong. Um, but it's been a long, really long journey for me to understand um, how racism manifests itself in this country and in myself, I should speak personally. <laughs> That's the harder. Um, it's easy. So I, I mentioned I, I teach college and so I've taught uh, something called critical race theory. So looking at different theorists um, on uh, the black perspective. And so I thought I knew that was a good education for me. It was eye opening. And I thought I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And I thought I was learning something and I think I did, but I have to say that it's really this last couple weeks where my heart knowledge is starting to, not there yet, catch up with my head knowledge. So if you'd asked me previously, is racism pervasive in this country? I would have said yes. I could have given you facts and details. But I don't know if my heart was really there until recently when the conversations with some of my friends of color have um, opened up uh, a deeper scrutiny of myself. So I just want to say that this is very much a journey that I'm on. And it's, it's not easy um, to see. One of my favorite quotations from James Baldwin is about how um, white people have a really hard time looking in the mirror um, because a, very, a statement you made about not being easy. It's not easy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What do you mean? It's not easy. Yeah. Not that's a great. <laughs> it's it's hard for me because I like to think of myself as a good, educated person, as a kind, loving, intelligent person, and so when I have seen recently elements of racism in my thinking, which looks like blindness, blindness that causes me to negate. So my blindness causes me to negate the experience of African Americans, of people of color. So I can be really quick to judge or to dismiss. Okay, so here's a, here's a very personal story about Beverly. 
Um, we've lived here since 20, uh, since 2006. I have a husband and two kids, a 14 year old and a 17 year old. And um, I've had several encounters with the police, both professionally and also on a personal, um, personal level. And they've all been totally positive. Like I felt the police were there for me to protect me. And I saw them talk about um, other white kids in a very non-punitive way, which shocked me. Um, I've spoken with Chief LaLacher several times and worked with Heath Meir, and I found him to be very intelligent and kind. Um, but I realized that this is not the experience of black people in Beverly. And so I can say, I, my kids and I feel protected by the police, but my heart has been broken hearing friends, many friends talk about how they do not feel that the police of Beverly are there for them and their families. Well, when you say the police in Beverly, is it all the police? There is a certain ones. Well, I think that they have had some encounters with specific ones, but I don't think it's any specific ones in general. I think it's an attitude, but I don't want to. I don't want to speak for them. Like I haven't met every police officer in Beverly. Well, the reason but, I bring the question up is uh -huh. there was one policeman I recognized that is on Facebook. And he has made the comment several times over the past couple of weeks that uh, the worst enemy of the bad cops is the good cops. So he's implying there is a dichotomy in the police force that some of the police are all in favor of it, uh, being uniform to everybody. Some police have a different attitude. And in favor the, of what? Can you just clarify what are they in favor of? What's the tension over? What's the tension of the police over? Well, I, okay, I think we get into the issue, and I think where I was going with this is the mayor of uh, Minneapolis made a comment that because of the unions, he does not have the power or the authority or the ability to get rid of bad cops. Uh, I take that thing with a very large grain of salt, the whole lick, that uh, he's the guy that negotiated the contract with the unions. And how come he left provisions in the contract that essentially emasculate him? And one of the other things we come across is um, when you start to identify people as victims, then they become extremely defensive and they develop an attitude that, hey, I'm a victim. I can do anything I want because I'm a victim. And to some extent, this is used as an explanation for why the uh, protests turn into riots. And it's also a possible explanation of why we get this concept of the thin blue line where all the police uh, back each other up because they figure it's them against the world. So, so George, um, yeah, but can we come back to that in a minute? Because I'd love to, I was talking about how in dialogue, I really like to begin with personal experience. Yeah. Um, so I've shared a little bit about mine and I'd, I'd love to hear your view about, um, you can talk about either, you know, how you came to view um, race, racism, whiteness, does that yeah, make sense? Lauren, that that would be awesome because so George, I one of I mean I met Lauren several years ago and she's Lauren, you've come to Zen Center several times, but a couple times to lead things. And I find it very helpful because this is emotional. This is emotional stuff. And George, you've told me in the past, I think we're all dealing with some measure of fear. You know, of where is this all going? We're, you know, in our country and in the world, because we're feeling that things are changing. And so I wonder if it would be helpful to take some time now to just come back to our own personal experience of what it was like growing up. Like Lauren, you started to share your story where you grow up and 
your parents and you know what you were born into and and you've you've given us prompts in the past about our own experience mm -hmm. first of all where we come from describing that you know kind of mm -hmm. tapping into the personal yeah. and then maybe from there other prompts that, that mm -hmm. might help us just as you said Lauren to get into the heart around this mm -hmm. because one thing I don't want this is not philosophy for me you know I was saying this earlier this is about people's lives mm -hmm. And I do feel very committed. I asked earlier, you know, what's the goal here? Like, why am I here? Why do I keep showing up for these things? And it's because I, I work with people of color and immigrants and, and they become people I love. And I see how they're impacted by racism. And I feel that things are changing. And for me, they're changing in a wonderful way, even though it's scary. And I want all of us to come along together. I don't want to leave anybody behind. I think this is about all of us. So for me, this is a sustainable conversation if it comes back to the personal and it, meaning it comes back to my heart. George, what do you think about that idea? Is that okay with you? Fine, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. So the, yeah, so the question that I had sort of answered that I was putting to George and I'll put to, to Joan is, um, you know, can you share a story that helps us understand how you came to understand your whiteness? Does that question make sense? Okay. Who's going to start? Yeah. Oh. Do you want me to? Okay. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island in a time frame when um, the Italians were taking over the political system of the state of Rhode Island. And it happened when uh, John O. Pastore got elected governor, and he was the first Italian governor. And it's O period Pastore, not O apostrophe. And there was a time when the Italians were considered to be people of color. And they were labeled with the usual derogatory terms uh, associated with it. And the neighborhood I lived in was very homogeneous, uh, mostly Irish. And uh, we had a couple of Germans. We had one Jewish family. But that was a totally different environment. It was a self-contained one. And um, as I ended up going into high school, all of a sudden I was uh, involved with lots of different kids from all over town because there was one parochial high school in Providence and it drew from the entire city. And the uh, environment in Providence was very, very insular in that there were certain communities that were associated with certain ethnic backgrounds. And I've told the story before that uh, there was an area in Providence called Federal Hill that uh, when my father was growing up in Senadale, which is a small community outside of Providence, uh, you didn't go to Senadale, you couldn't go from Senadale to Federal Hill without all your buddies. Because if you weren't Italian, or in his case, if you weren't Irish, uh, you were in enemy territory. And when I was growing up, it flopped over so that if you weren't Italian, uh, you just didn't go there. And there was other sections of town that were noted that these are areas for these people only, and you go into them at your own risk. So when I talk about fears and pre prejudgments, that's what my background is. And uh, getting thrown into the army where it's a totally different environment. If you go into these things, as I matured, grow, grew up, whatever you want to call it, um, I kept getting involved in bigger and bigger uh, groups with more and more different kinds of people with different attitudes and backgrounds. And being stationed in the South, I was well aware of some of the conflicts 
that were going on in people's mind over being close to somebody else that uh, wasn't their kind. And somewhere along the line, I got the message, and I'm not sure how accurate it is, but basically in Europe, uh, the people up north look down on anybody that lives south of them. And uh, we got into a discussion one time when I was working for a living. Uh, I was in Turkey, and we were having a very uh, difficult negotiation. And all of a sudden, the president of TUSASH, which stands for Turkish Aircraft Factory, exploded in Turkish. And the whole room went quiet. And uh, we broke off the meeting and went outside and uh, got our interpreter says, what happened? And uh, what he essentially said, and I think he tamed it down considerably, that uh, the president of Tusash accused us of treating them like a bunch of Africans. Only I think he were used the uh, Turkish equivalent to the N-word when he did that. So there is a hierarchy in some people's minds as to who's good and who's bad. And I got into this recently. Um, I've got a, my cousin has got a daughter who's a Episcopal priest. She's now stationed in New Bedford, I think. And uh, she is also quite involved like Joan is in uh, the Black Lives Matter and uh, race relationships and so forth. And I've been going around with her on it based on a lot of stuff. And there is a fundamental disagreement between me and her and between me and Joan, for that matter, on what is the problem. And from a technical point of view, which is my background, uh, unless you can define the problem correctly, there's no way you can find the solution. And I get very excited about the word racism for exactly that reason. In the species Homo sapiens, there are no races. So we're talking about something that really doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, how do you fix it? And I can go on for about yeah. a talk on that, as you can imagine. But yeah, yeah. so that, um, yeah, I'm aware of the differences. I've been exposed to them. Yeah, uh, I see what you're saying. So you've seen, it sounds like you, you've, you were aware of race at a very pretty young age. Uh, oh, yeah. You've experienced some uh, fear around it. More of, not so much race, more of ethnicity. Ethnicity, uh huh. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about when you say that racism doesn't, it, or you said that racism doesn't, a race, a race doesn't exist. Yeah. And I, I agree with you on a biological level. I think you're at, you know, all the scientists would agree. But what do you think about, you know, when you see somebody of a different ethnicity, maybe you see a different religious attire or color skin, etc. Um, how do you avoid not seeing them as, what does it mean for you to look at that person who's clearly different from you? Not biologically, right? We're all human. But what does it mean for you to look at that person and not see race? How do you see that person? Well, it's, the best way I can explain it is when you go into a situation that you've never been in before, if somebody's new is approaching you, um, you you're stepping into a, a, a bill, some sort of building in a different area, you have to make a judgment as to what do you expect. You got to make a guess as to what you should be prepared for. And when you look at someone, they come with a stereotype, whether you like it or not. Right. One of my favorite Irish jokes is two Irishmen walked out of a bar. 
What do you mean? Well, it could really happen. That is, it's a play on the stereotype of the Irish being notoriously heavy drinkers, which is not necessarily universally true, but it's part of the uh, stereotype. And you can go through the stereotypes of uh, just about every ethnic group. Right. Yeah. Um, I just, sorry to intervene. I just realized I, I, I was so like wanted to talk to you that I, and Joan's at the bottom of my screen. So I just forgot about her story. But um, before we get back to this, can we ask Joan about her to just tell a little bit about her story before we get, get back to the question of race and race? Speaking of the hierarchy, <laughs> George, I'm on the bottom of the screen. Yes, you are. I'm on top of you. Sorry. <laughs> well, guess what? From my point of view, Lauren, you're on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> George, what about you? I feel better. All three of us are on the top of my screen. George, are you on the bottom of the screen on your own screen? No, I'm on the top. <laughs> he said all. He said all three of us are on the top. So that's oh, is that right? You oh, have the egalitarian special. <laughs> well, so yeah, thanks, Lauren. I I would like to because I I you know I'm a meditation teacher. I'm a Zen priest. That means I teach meditation. That means I do meditation every day. And and so that meditation for me, you know, at least right now, is about coming back to the story, coming back to who is this person, me, you know, where do I come from which I think is helpful in knowing where I want to go, like in contextualizing myself right here. So yeah, um, what I'd like to share is my last name is Amaral and that's Portuguese. And I grew up in Concord, New Hampshire. And I don't remember any other Portuguese people in town. We were kind of exotic, but I didn't feel exotic growing up, but I just wonder if I was kind of exotic in my school. There were a lot of Italians, there were a lot of Irish, there were Greeks. All the Italian restaurants were run by Greeks. We didn't have any Greek restaurants. Um, and, and, but my, it's only my paternal grandfather, who's Portuguese, he married a French Canadian. And then that's my dad's side. And then on my mother's side, it's more of the, you know, the, the mosh pit <laughs> of England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, you know, all of that. But I, I've identified most our family spelled it differently growing up because it had been misspelled when my grandfather arrived from the Azores. But I, I just remember one story of feeling so much shame around being Portuguese. George, you mentioned New Bedford. My, so your, is it your daughter-in-law? Who's the UU minister? Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> Trick. Anyway, you don't need to. My cousin's answer. daughter. Your cousin's daughter. Okay, yeah. So she probably works with a lot of Brazilians. Um, there were a lot of Portuguese before that. Um, and between New Bedford and Fall River, my grandfather arrived in Fall River. And I can't remember if it was Fall River or New Bedford. Was it in the 70s or the early 80s? There was a movie made out of this called The Accused. Was it The Accused? Was that what it was called? The one with Jodie yes, Foster? Yes, or was it, was it Jodie Foster? Yeah, yeah. yeah, about the group of Portuguese men, the gang rape in the bar. And this was Portuguese men. And um, I just, when I look, I felt shame and I didn't know where that came from, but I felt really aware of being Portuguese. And all of a sudden, just feeling like cultural shame around that. You know, um, and that's always kind of a thing that comes up for me when I think about ethnicity, you know, in my childhood growing up. Uh, and I was just having a conversation with my mother yesterday. My mother, I mentioned earlier off this, is has been a lifelong Republican, as was my dad. Um, and my mother, I called her yesterday because I really wanted to reach out to her. I let her know some of the work that I've been doing with immigrants. And I wanted her to know her role in that. It's basically her fault <laughs> that I'm doing this work with immigrants. You know, depending upon your point of view, it's either her fault or she could be, you know, be 
exposed me to different cultures early on. We had an exchange student from the Philippines. I remember this. I must have been like four or five. Her name was Angie. I still remember. She's in her 80s, and my parents were divorced um, after 25 years of marriage, and it was a very difficult divorce. And my mother's had a lot of issues. She's had a lot of, she had a difficult childhood and she's not been an easy mom. And so when I talk with her, it always feels kind of like a minefield, like how is this gonna go? But when I started to talk to her about how much she exposed me to different cultures growing up, she also encouraged me to be a Rotary Exchange student. So I, that's why I was in France as a junior in high school. And um, you know, she really planted that seed you know, and so it's her. And, and isn't that interesting that, you know, she watches Fox News and she's, you know, very, uh, what I would say, closed minded about a lot of things. And yet when I started talking with her about how much she influenced my life and the choices that I'm making now, she got very happy, George, on the phone. All of a sudden we weren't on opposite sides of an argument. We were on the same side of having these beautiful memories. She started talking about how her favorite decades of her life were the 60s and the 70s because she was raising her children and she was married to our dad. And I was like, what? <laughs> I never heard her talk about how much she enjoyed her marriage. But she, I could feel the energy through the phone of, of these beautiful memories you know, that she has that, that could be, those seeds could be watered and it could be it could be happy memories and it could be connecting you know anyway i i, I just want to share that and and this is what i i hope you know esther my friend who you both know who's kenyan i think most people maybe watching this will maybe know of esther um esther's excited to meet my mom and i'm nervous i don't know how it's gonna how my mom's gonna receive her but Esther's very excited. She says, oh, that would be so cool to meet your mother. She's up for the adventure. And so I guess I will be too. And I feel like I want to give my mom the benefit of the doubt and, you know, see what happens. Anyway, thanks. All right, now where were we? <laughs> now that we've all had our... <laughs> I have another question, actually, George. This is and this is a risky question, and but Lauren's here, and Lauren is a kind presence. Um, I want to come back, George, to something you said about you said some people see things in term see human beings in terms of hierarchy. You yeah. know, the Turkish about Africans, and that was my experience in France. Many French people say the third world starts at the Pyrenees. <laughs> you know, beginning with Spain. Yeah. And then the Spanish have their own things that they like to say about Mexicans. So, um, but since we're getting personal in this conversation, the question I have for you, George, is do you also see things in terms of racial or ethnic hierarchy? Um, not so much racial or, racial or ethnic hierarchy, but more about what is the possible threat or what is the possible problem? Uh, I'll give you, for instance, uh, one of my first exposés into uh, international marketing. I got told, okay, you're going to meet the Mac Air team at the hotel uh, such and such in Athens, Greece on the next Tuesday. What? I can't speak Greek. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I was literally going around the office trying to find a secretary of Greek uh, heritage and find out how to say taxi. You know, we get the fundamental things. And uh, it, as it turns out, uh, was a, wasn't the problem I anticipated. But I think that's how we get into some of these things that we anticipate what can go wrong and what do I need to do to protect myself against it. And uh, I think, well, I can remember, think about that show we did, uh, Joan, about uh, two episodes ago where we were talking about this professor from uh, the Mass Art School who had gotten stopped by the police. And he was going on about uh, 
how kind of a, how much of a scary situation it was for him because the cop walked up to him and the first thing he noticed the cop doing, he's taking the little leather, leather uh, strap off his gun and he's got his hand on the, the gun. But when we, we had looked at the picture that he showed uh, of himself, how he was dressed, he looks kind of threatening to me. He's, he appears to be much taller than me. He's wearing a beard. He's got sunglasses on. I don't know him. I don't know how close I can afford to get to him without having to get into a situation. Could you describe what he was wearing that you felt was threatening so Lauren can know? The combination of his size, the beard, and the sunglasses. I read that as a threatening situation. But what about the color of his skin? That was minor. Yeah, he's colored. That's for sure. But somebody that size, or they appear to be that size, uh, looks physically threatening. And if you want to get into something interesting, go back to my story about Turkey. When I was dealing with Turkey, this is back maybe 30, 40 years ago now, uh, Turkey was a secular country and they were under the influence of Gamal Ataturk who resurrected the country after World War I. And in those days, anybody that wore any facial, any men that wore any facial hair, beards or mustaches were considered to be terrorists. And now you look at uh, people from that country and there's beards all over the place. So it's a symbol of something to some people sometime, and it changes. So, so the question yeah. of how do you approach somebody like that? And when we had this discussion about that uh, incident with the professor, uh, Joan, I remember you making the comment that uh, the cop came up to him with his hand on the whole gun and he should have been presumed innocent because according to our legal system, everybody's innocent until proven guilty. But yet at the same time, the cop is walking into a situation that he doesn't know what's happening. All he's heard is somebody tried to break into a house and it looks like him. And looks like is a very fuzzy term, I understand. But how much risk can the cop take? Or how much is he willing to take? And I think that gets to be the question that gets totally ignored in a lot of these situations. So just a, um, a question about, I mean, back to this question about the, the racism. Um, if I heard you correctly, so you think you're, what you're saying is that because race doesn't exist, that racism doesn't exist that did i have your position correct yeah okay racism, so, the racism doesn't exist but I, i'm well aware that there is a hierarchy in a lot of people's minds of different things in fact joan mentioned it earlier she said she felt very uncomfortable mm -hmm. when these uh, portuguese men raped somebody Mm -hmm. because it implied that her identity as Portuguese was threatened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it well, it was more that, that I would be judged just by being Portuguese, that I would be automatically assumed to be, you yeah. know, part of that, well, which is the it? thing, which is the thing. Like if that police officer were black, approaching a black man, do you think he would have felt as threatened? That's what we're getting at. Because the question I asked you, George, was do you, do you see a hierarchy in terms of human beings? Not really. Because by, I used to, I mean, if you weren't Irish or English, because uh, that's my background. Mm -hmm. But I having been around the world a few times, yeah, maybe we wouldn't even be talking. You're talking to a Portuguese woman. <laughs> <laughs> there goes uh, the neighborhood. I have, 
I have some Irish in me, so I'm okay. No, but it, um, <laughs> it comes down to what, what kind of a growth process have I gone through? So, I don't know. Um, I, have, I have a question about, you know, I hear, I hear both you and Joan speaking about your experience as um, ethnic minorities, right, growing up in various ways and how that made you feel afraid. Um, and that's what I hear black people saying today. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't care whether you call it race, ethnicity, identity. I, I, I'm not attached to any of those terms right now, but I, so I guess I was wondering how would you, George, like, explain this insecurity and the fear that people who are identify as black are experiencing during this time? Isn't, the, isn't there a, a similarity? Like I'm not saying it's equal on all levels, but is, do, do you see a similarity there? The similarity I see well, is there. Mm -hmm. The people who are long-term Americans with an African heritage are now living in the low rent district. Mm -hmm. And the low rent district is a very scary place in any city. Uh, you scary, look at, scary, uh, scary how? Physically scary. For, for you or for them? Both. Going into that area, if you don't belong there, you could be potentially a victim. Or just being there, you could be a victim. You look at the statistics in Chicago, especially. And you can I'm, look I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna pull a Joan because I, I know she's really. Okay. <laughs> so I, because I just to clarify my question was about their experience not about a white person coming into that neighborhood. So I am I was asking more because I heard you describe being Irish, afraid to walk through the Italian district, yeah. you didn't go alone. So that was your fear as the minority. So I'm asking, what do you think that black people in the minority of the country okay. feel? After I got out of the army, uh, it's been a year in Chicago with a wife and a newborn baby. We went to St. James Church. Never forget this. All the priests were Irish. Most of the congregation of the, were of some color. And I remember one Sunday, the priest gave a sermon on this very subject of uh, relationships with the people of different color. And he was going on at some length, he was a white priest, by the way, talking about how the um, African community was put down and not thought of very highly. And they were prejudiced against them. And you could see people sitting up talking, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. Then he went into it, and within the community, the shade of color makes the difference. So even within a particular community, uh, there are gradations of hierarchy, if you will, of who's better than who. And unfortunately, for the, uh, the African community, uh, the closer you are to white, uh, the hierarchy is in your favor. That was his message. And this was back in 1961. Mm -hmm. So it's not something new. It's been there for quite some time. So you see that still today, that hierarchy? I believe it's still there. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in fact, I'm most confident. Um, I'm going through a book right now by Layla Saad, S-A-A-D, mm -hmm. on me and white supremacy is the title mm -hmm. of the book. And she gets into the discussion of uh, how people are different and have different attitudes 
And she brings up exactly that point that there are all sorts of gradations between different peoples of what you would normally consider the same group. And yeah. So it sounds like we it sounds like we sort of agree then that the, in this country there's a hierarchy with white at the top. Some people in some people's mind, maybe in a lot of people's mind, mm -hmm. there is a built-in hierarchy. And what and I can get back to my soapbox about the media, they don't tell you that right now the highest earning people in this country are Asians, men, not white men, Asian men. But you don't hear about that. And if you don't hear about that, all of a sudden, your pre-notion or your preconceived idea of who's better than who doesn't get readjusted or doesn't get challenged. Well, let's see. I wonder if we can bring it like back into the personal again, just for the last few minutes. Um, and and I, I really appreciate, Lauren, I appreciate so much your presence and George, your, your steadfastness, you know, of continuing the conversation and responding, just responding to these inquiries. So um, George, this homework from last week, because people may be wondering, yeah, okay. Were you able, do you remember your homework? Oh, yeah. What was it? Well, you set me up. <laughs> you got your friend to send me an email. No, I didn't. I did not. I just told her what your homework was. You told me what my homework was, and you said you were going to get me some connections. And you No, did. I said if you need help, let me know. I can hook you up. <laughs> but wait, what was the homework? I didn't even have to me. ask you to hook me up, and you did. Anyway, I got a, oh. I got an email from your friend. So wait, wait, well, what are we talking about? People don't know. Describe it. It was your turn. It was your idea. <laughs> it was your homework. All right. So the issue was I had had that profound moment at that conference. You know, there are hundreds of us and step into the center of the room. If you received a text in the last week from someone of a different race, you know, and I asked myself, wow, have I, you know, and for a different race over to your house for dinner. This is this points to not Lauren used the word tokenism. It's not tokenism. It's like, are we open to letting our lives not just by race, by being alive, <laughs> you know, or do we have some fixed view of how our life is supposed to be and what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to feel like? Um, the book report. I did, in fact, get an email from a person of with a very deep tan. You, you mean know? a black person? I don't like using the word black. Well, it sounds because weird to say with a really I deep tan. Beyond sharing, I would flip up a couple of memes that uh, are contrary to that. But anyway, that's another story for another show. We're running out of time. I assume you disappear, turn into a pumpkin at six o'clock, like usual. Yeah. Because yeah. it'll be time to meditate, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she sent me an email, and I sent one back talking about the relationship we had previously. And uh, she sent me another email talking about a common uh, experience between me and her daughter, mm. both combat engineers, or both in the Corps of Engineers. Right? Yes. So I sent an email back, and that's where it ended. Now, as part of this story, slightly different twist, um, I responded to a Facebook page with a positive comment. And the gentleman whose comment I agreed with sent me a long email, which was fine. And I sent him a long email back, and then he sent me another one. So that got to be a very interesting discussion. And now the question is, does he qualify? Because he's Italian. 
qualify as what? At the same time. Oh, you mean as a friend of color? <laughs> you want to give extra credit. Back in, the, back in the 20s. <laughs> back when I was growing up, I told you, the Italians were considered to be people of color. When I was running for the school committee back in, what was it, 67, 68, I was warned, you got to watch out for the Italians downtown. Mm. Okay. And about the same thing, do you know Jerry Gillespie? Okay. He used to be the city's uh, veterans affairs manager. And he's since retired from the city payroll. And he sent around uh, a Facebook page talking about how Italians were told, do not apply for this job. So it was not only Irish need not apply, it was Italians need not apply. Then he added to it that the worst lynching in this country was when a group of Italians were taken out of the jail in New Orleans and strung up. And shortly thereafter, there was a major purge of the area of anybody of Italian extraction. So that's when I get back on my other soapbox about, hey, this has been going on for a long time. Different people get dragged into it at the same level and at the same point. And it's not anything new that the African Americans are being inflicted with. It's the same problem we've had for years. And there was an interesting article in the, the Economist magazine that talked about um, some professor, I forget what his name was, I can look it up. George, yeah, so stuff. when I spoke earlier about this is not philosophy because th this is people's lives, I'm gonna say it again right now in this context. You know, I don't care about whether or not this is new or not. I don't care about that. What I care about is my action. And what I care about, frankly, is your action. That's why I'm in this conversation with you. Yeah. So here's something. I want to share something from my monastic training. It's going to get kind of weird. It's Zen, a Zen monastery. I was the Eno. The Eno means in a Japanese monastery, the head of the meditation hall. My sort of boss was the Tanto, the head of practice. The Tanto was treating me kind of weird. And I went to him and I said, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, what? when I was when I was the Eno, there were all these women in charge. There was a woman president, there was a woman abbess, there was a woman director, and they treated me terribly. And I said, you know what? His name was Kosho. Maybe he'll watch this. I said, Kosho, you know, you have a choice here. You can treat me the way you were treated and we can perpetuate the pain or you can treat me the way you want. You wished you had been treated and we can start fresh. And that that was a moment for me that that happened like 20 years ago. And that's so fresh to me when I look at racism and when I look at this conversation we're having, it's up to us and we have a choice. We can go this way or this way. What's it going to be? We can go the way of awakening of like, oh, yeah, we don't need to fall into, you know, this is just the latest. Or we can just fall into this is just the latest. And then we just become victims of it. That's the choice we have. And I think, you know, it, it sounds like. Let me finish the point I was in the middle of. That we are about to become in violent agreement. That's another interesting comment. But. The article I was alluding to was talking about the number of race riots that we have had in this country since the 1920s. And every one of them had a commission that looked into it and says, oh yeah, that's bad. We ought to do something different about it. And nothing ever got done. And the same commission would, same commission recommendations would come up year after year after year. And the one that gets me most excited is back in 65, there was a riot in Watts. And the phrase that, that was generated is burn, baby, burn, became a hit song on the top 40. And it got nowhere. And the same thing is going on right now with no justice, no peace will burn everybody down. 
it ain't going to work. It's the wrong solution. And that's my real complaint is, yeah, we can talk about it, but if we keep using the same solutions over and over again that didn't work the last time, why do we think we're going to have a different outcome this time? All right. I, think that's what, I just wanted to say, I think that's where, I mean, we all agree there's a problem and it's been going, we all agree it's been going on for a long time. And we all agree that what we've tried in the past doesn't work. So now where we disagree is what can, what can we do about it? Not necessarily. I don't think we disagree because the person you invoked, George, there's a great idea percolating right now. Maybe that's for the next installment. Thum, thum, thum. <laughs> <laughs> because it is time we got the feedback we went on too long last time we got to listen to the feedback <laughs> thank some you people have accused me of being vaccinated by a photograph needle <laughs> you kids don't understand that but that's no we don't thank you. yeah <laughs> lauren thank you so much for joining oh, us thank you for inviting me yeah great to meet you george and speak with you and get to know you a little bit better and ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Joan has already threatened, we're going to do this again sometime in the near future. Hey, tune in again. And then in the meantime, if you got some thoughts, you, the audience, have some thoughts on what we should be covering or some thoughts that we should consider, please send me an email or put it on the Facebook page and I'll find it. Thanks again for joining us and good night, all. <laughs>